And happy Friday. Uh, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. It is an awesome Friday. Uh, as I've told you all this week, Uncle Jimmy's doing well. He's recovering. I think he will visit us uh, next week via Skype. Uh, as I told you yesterday, have an awesome show uh, planned for us today. Uh, Kwame Brown. It's gonna be in the house right here on Fearless. Uh, there's going to be an explosion of masculinity on this show today uh, because Kwame Brown's our guest. Uh, you guys know all the noise uh, Kwame Brown made this past uh, summer uh, when he checked Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson and set the internet on fire and has built a massive YouTube following. Uh, he's one of the most uh, important new personalities we have in the media space, in the sports media space. Obviously, he was the former number one draft pick of the Washington Wizards uh, when Michael Jordan was there and, and was labeled a bust uh, and, and was ridiculed as a bust. Uh, but Kwame put some respect on his name and added some perspective to his career uh, that was necessary. and basically checked everyone from trying to make a joke out of him. Uh, so I can't wait uh, to talk to uh, Kwame Brown. You guys know I've been a supporter of Kwame ever since he exploded. And he's had a YouTube channel, I think, for several years, but he exploded in 2021, and I've been a supporter, and it, so it's good. Uh, I, I wanted to get my show up and rolling before I invited uh, Kwame on and engage with him. So. This will be an outstanding show, uh, a collaboration. We'll see if uh, the new Justice League, if we, you know, I'm Batman, he's Superman, or I'm Superman, he's Batman. Uh, anyway, I'm excited to have Kwame on. And so I wanna set the table for me and Kwame's discussion and I think why it's important. It's not, not quite, this is more of a bonfire than a fire starter. The fire's gonna start once we bring Kwame into the show. I'm just gonna lay the wood down, start rubbing some sticks together. Uh, this isn't quite a fire starter. I just wanna set the table and the framework for why I think Kwame's important, why I think what Kwame's doing on his YouTube channel, I think it's called Bus Life, uh, why I think it's important, and why I think there's synergy between what Kwame's doing and what I'm doing and what I see from uh, other guy, Kevin Samuels, uh, Boyce Watkins, and for, all the way to Kyrie Irving and Dave Chappelle, I think there's a synergy among men, and I, I think there's some energy uh, among black men that's finally starting to buck up and push back and stand up and be real men. And, and the reason why Kwame's important because this has to happen in the sports space has to happen in the sports space. The, the sports space has been overtaken by the matriarchy and by a feminine energy. And that's why I call ESPN the Emasculated Sports Personalities Network. The Emasculated Sports Personalities Network. And that network, ESPN, has launched its first movie. And it's been going for the past year, uh, and it's called The Crying Game. Everybody over at ESPN is crying. And, you know, it, it starts with a friend of mine, Kirk Herbstreet. Uh, I like and respect Kirk. You know, I, I, before me and Randy Moss had this recent beef where he's threatening to beat me up, I halfway liked Randy Moss. Uh, Ryan Clark, I don't really have an opinion on. I, I know he loves to play the tough guy role and uh, you know he's, he's ESPN's resident tough guy and he likes to threaten Marcellus Wiley or anybody that questions him and he'll, at some point maybe he'll question me. Maybe it's on, on site with Ryan Clark, but uh, between Herb Street, Moss, and Ryan Clark, the crying has to stop. The crying game has to end. The Emasculated uh, Sports Personalities Network has to return the balls to all of their male personalities.
they may have to remove some of these women from the set who host these shows and inject that estrogen and that feminine energy into every conversation. And basically everybody sits down at a desk and whoever the female host is says, all right guys, hand me over your balls. I'm gonna hold them until we're off TV. That's gotta stop. And that's why I'm calling these guys out. I saw Maria Taylor put uh, Kirk Herbstreet in a spot. I just saw Sam Ponder last week and we've been talking about last Sunday. Oh, Randy, how can the Raiders play? Oh, they've got such heavy hearts. John Gruden said, DeMora Smith has big lips. I just don't know how they can play. Randy, come cry on my shoulder. All that BS has to stop. The Emasculated Sports Personalities Network has to be checked. The crying game that they've instituted. Do we have the clip of of all the crying, all the, t the tears for jeers group. Uh, do, do we have that clip? And so you can't relate to that if you're white, but you can listen and you can uh, try to help because this is not okay. It's just not. Thank you for everybody that reached out to me. And um, like, I know it's getting better, but it's not better, better yet and better for everybody. And, um, you know, like, we just got to keep, you know, staying together, man, and just doing what we can. Yeah. And for us to be moving back and not forward in 21st century, like I said, man, National Football League, this hurts me. The clock is ticking, man. I'm I sorry. I got balls enough for all these guys that have been emasculated. You come on this show fearless, there's no uh, woman that's gonna be sitting here saying, hey guys, give me your balls. You get to keep your balls. And this entire show and endeavor, and again, it's why I'm having Kwame on, I'm trying to inspire men to stand up and be men. I'm trying to build a fearless army. And it's not just the personalities, I'm actually talking directly to you. Are you man enough to be fearless? Because if you're not, you're going to continue to be castrated and emasculated in this society. They're going to continue to put you in a closet. If you're not man enough, if you're not fearless enough to stand up. And so for those of you watching on YouTube, youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock, Hop in those comments, hop in the live chat, hit the likes button, but also I need you to put in the live chat in, in, the, in, the, in the comments that you're man enough to join the fearless army. You're man enough to be inducted into a fearless army. And for the ladies watching, I need you to be woman enough to say, you're gonna support these fearless men as we attempt to take this country back from the people that are emasculating and castrating traditional men. We gotta put the Emasculated Sports Personalities Network on notice that we're not taking this anymore. That black men just don't get to go run on TV and have a white woman say dance or cry and then they fall apart because John Gruden sent an email. Man up. We're living in that time for people to man up. If you're not willing to man up, go sit in the corner somewhere, get off TV, uh, go play house somewhere. Go pretend like you're down for, oh my God, if someone says they're transphobic or they're trans or whatever, I'm down with that and we must support the trans community. And again, I'm not anti-trans, but th this little, uh, well, hell, maybe I am because this whole little thing of a, however I feel, that's who I am, I'm calling bullshit on that. I'm not remaking the world because someone feels like a woman, because some biological man feels like a woman. I'm not going to sit here on the sidelines and watch them say, oh, yeah, little boy, you can go compete against these girls. 
steal their joy, their accomplishments. I'm not sitting on the sidelines and just taking that. And if that offends someone, I don't care. They don't care if their point of view offends me. I don't care if mine offends them. So, uh, all right, I'm, I'm running a little late to get to the star of the show. Kwame Brown's coming on. Let me just say this uh, before I, we get to Kwame. I want to tell you about my friends at Good Ranchers. For the best quality meats, you need to start shopping with our friends over at Good Ranchers. Stop going to your local grocery store and purchasing ungraded and imported meats from overseas. Get with Good Ranchers and experience the best. It's 100% American farm-raised chicken and grass-fed, grain-finished beef. Their beef is of the highest US, USDA grade possible and will simply amaze you in the taste and quality, especially when compared to their competitors. Whether it's their Family Feast, their Rancher's Classic, or their great prime seafood package, you'll get an amazing meal for everyone in your family to truly enjoy. Stop, stop waiting, go order right now, go join. This is how you induct yourself into the Fearless Army. You support our sponsors. You support the people feeding fearless soldiers. GoodRanchers.com slash fearless, get steakhouse quality for less than $5 a meal. GoodRanchers.com slash fearless, get $20 off and free express shipping. That's GoodRanchers.com slash fearless. All right, welcome back. Without further ado, uh, let's head out to Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, or maybe in Atlanta. Uh, let's head out to the star of the show, uh, one of the most fearless and courageous uh, voices operating in the media space, in the sports media space, uh, has a terrific YouTube channel, Kwame Brown Bus Life. Uh, I think we all took notice of Kwame in May, uh, when he put Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson in check, uh, but Kwame had actually been doing uh, his YouTube channel long before that, uh, but when he decided to uh, set the record straight on whether or not he was a bust and whether or not he was gonna continue to tolerate people taking little pot shots at him, I think we all took notice of him. Kwame's been a, a volcano, an eruption that I've told everyone, I think Kwame's important. Uh, I, I think he opened the space uh, for other people in the sports world, like myself, to follow in behind him and, and come in with a bit more of a masculine energy, uh, a traditional male energy and point of view uh, that I think is necessary if this country is going to survive. If we keep going down this emasculated role, and keep being letting all these punks drive all the conversation, America's done. So uh, Kwame, uh, welcome to Fearless. Uh, and I'm wondering, we'll start here, Kwame, when you put Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson in check, did you think it would lead to all of this? Did you think like, oh, I'm about to really impact the culture? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, it just seems like, um, I think a lot of the stuff that I've been saying, men speak like that anyway. We just have to hide in the closet or in the barbershop. Uh, no pun intended, intended with the whole closet thing, but uh, men have been speaking like that for forever. It's just now it's so hypersensitive that we only have, you know, safe spaces that you can talk like a man. And so I think, you know, by me talking and it just exposing the difference between a true man and a man who speaks in a way that's disrespectful, that you would not speak to a man to his face without conflict, I think people saw the difference and they gravitated towards me. So when this happened and you got all of this attention, what was your reaction? How did you transition? Like, whoa, there's an opportunity here. Obviously you've been doing a YouTube channel before that, uh, but, but what were those first days and weeks like when you became a YouTube star and, and it became quite clear that you had created a, a, a voice and a space for Kwame Brown to be heard? Well, the first week, like I said, I, I, I pretty much took it as business as usual. 
uh, I didn't like when it, once it started going into uh, the second and third week uh, when Charlemagne the guy and Jamel Hill and some of the people start saying language that I knew uh, that as a black man could paint a picture of you that others that may not have known you or never met you on that type of level um, could cause a negative effect in real life. Uh, using words like violence, um, painting a picture of my family and, and my father and telling me things that I did not know. That's when I knew I was on to something. I'm like, you know what, this is, get, this is getting a little scary. You know, it started off by me trying to check two peers of mine uh, in a sports world that they, they are supposed to understand on the same level as I understand it. And that you don't stop another man's earn. Uh, I haven't played basketball in over 20 years. I mean, well, 10 years and uh, 10 plus years. And so for me to be able to walk around this earth and you still bring my name up in a negative light, um, I'm a hero to some kids. I'm a mentor to cer certain kids. And you have those kids keep hearing stuff uh, that you think about me as an opinion. Um, that can kind of sway the narrative and make, in today's world make that kid think that a person like myself doesn't have any validity, which I, I absolutely do. And that's where my defense of you really start, started and my understanding of what you were doing. Because you talk about kids, I'm thinking about your own kids. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. like, this man is saying, hey look, Matt Barnes, Stephen Jackson, Stephen A. Smith, y'all think y'all just talking about me, but you're actually talking about the father of these kids who could actually hear these comments and look at their daddy like, oh, oh, you're a laughing stock. And, and so I was like, I completely understood where Kwame was like, no, 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 y'all got to cut this out. When I was playing basketball and y'all want to talk about me on the court, but now that I've transitioned into a father, a provider, someone in my community, and just for y'all to get some cheap laughs or uh, giggles off, that's what I respected. I saw a father standing up. Right. So what, what, what can you do as a black man to get respect? If you're saying that me making history and, and me providing for my family, me, play, me making it to the 1%, 501 people per year come to take my job, I'm always securing one for over a decade, what what can you what can you do as a black man for society to look at you as a man without you know it's never seems to be good enough you have to be the best of the best to to be good enough you have to be lebron or this elite group so what does that say to the football coach who's uh you know helping train these athletes who's helped sending kids to college who's a good man who's a good father like what is he on the spectrum if a number one draft pick, if you're going to just hold him to a game his entire life, like nothing about his life is good because your opinion of his basketball skills were subpar or below par. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I, being the number one draft pick, uh, you know, throws off people's expectations. And, and really, I, the other thing that, that, shook me or, or surprised me was like, I'm a pretty good sports journalist, think I follow everything really closely, but until you stood up in May, I really hadn't properly analyzed your career and what happened. And so you put some perspective on like where the Wizards were at that time, how Jordan wanted to win immediately and had no real interest in developing an 18 or 19 year old uh, kid at that time, that I don't know why that never clicked in my head in real time when this was going on, but you open, and that's what I was disappointed with from Steven Jackson to Matt Barnes to Stephen A. Smith. Y'all supposed to understand the game. Y'all follow it very, very closely. Two of these guys played in the NBA. Why couldn't they put those pieces together you had to put the pieces together for everybody else, but that, that's, and again, I don't want, I'm, I'm not trying to tee you up to take any shots at Michael Jordan or what, because the past is the past, but you were put in a very tough spot in Washington 
because of where Jordan was at that time in his career and how he wanted to win right now? Yeah, I mean, and I tell people all the time, I forgave him for it. That's why I never really talked bad about him because, like I said, he gave my family, uh, not really gave, but I, I had an opportunity to play ball based on my talent. Um, but um, me being around Michael and just me being around, just I've been around a lot of great players. And to be that good, you have to be a little bit selfish. And so MJ is one of those guys that, you know, people are afraid of. They're not going to go against. They know what happened to me in Washington. All the reporters, that's why when I finally came out and said it, said something, everybody kind of was mum as the word. Um, there's not been one reporter that came and challenged me on anything I said because they already knew the answer to it. And they still know the answer to it. But uh, MJ is still and forever going to be rooted into the sports world. And even reporters now, if you say the wrong thing, you probably could be out of a job. So I understood early on, you know, that I was being used as like a pawn uh, because so many players came out of high school. And that was damaging the college's bottom line. You know, for players to go to colleges, that's a, like me, when I was going to go to the University of Florida, it was going to be me, David Lee, and James White, where you got three McDonald's All-American, and then you had Anthony Robeson coming in the next year. And then you had, uh, I think you had Mike Miller was still there. He was going to be there when I got there my freshman year, and Teddy Dupay. So you're talking about having five or six McDonald's All-American is on one campus, on one team. That's a lot of money. Uh, so it, I keep telling people this thing is about money. And uh, us black folks, we haven't wake up and, and, and smell the coffee yet. We keep taking our talent and making other people enrich. And when you don't play by the rules, you know, you get the treatment of Kwame Brown. If you go back and watch any game I played, whether it be year three, year four, or year eight, when I'm, when I'm playing well, if you listen to the commentating, all they keep going back to is that I was the number one draft pick. There's one game I got 28 points, 13 rebounds in Miami, and they're still talking about me being the number one draft pick. They're never talking about what I'm doing now, and they never look at the analytics to say, man, when this guy plays 30 minutes a game, he's on pace with every, you know, all top 10 guys in the league at his position. They never looked at that. They just looked at, he was the number one draft pick. Michael said he was a buzz. Michael said he had small hands, and that was, that's been the narrative ever since. So, big picture, Kwame, what, what your YouTube channel and what you're trying to do in the media space, what's your purpose, what's your message, what do you want your viewers, your audience to glean from Kwame Brown? I want black folks to stop negotiating from their neighborhoods and where they're from and all their shortcomings. They, uh, they make us look at our position as it's just an opportunity of a lifetime. We're doing you a favor. No, look at the numbers of how many of us blacks are in the sports world. We are dominating the sports world. We're dominating a lot of different spaces. We're just not owning anything. So start, I, I believe Master P and his sons uh, could start a domino effect. And, and shout out to the Millers, they're gonna force people to go down and watch this young kid play. They're gonna, they're gonna, and right away, cash is gonna be going to this HBCUs and sponsorships. And that's what more and more of these top athletes need to do. They need to take some of that power back uh, by going to some of these black schools so you don't have to beg for money. They'll get the, the big deals, they'll get the network deals because there's no choice. We're coming to see the talent. And that will, that will swing the, our negotiating uh, position a little bit better. So we're not talking about, like Allen Iverson, I always talk about Allen Iverson. I have friends that I grew up with that they were on a, a path of a life of crime. But because they watched Allen Iverson play basketball, they put guns down, they put the bad behavior that they was doing away because they looked at AI because he looked like them. He had the tattoos, he had the sleeve, he had the braids. They was like, well, if he can make it, then I can make it. And it's that belief and that ideal is, that's all sometimes kids can hold on to. Um, so we have to stop allowing the media to change the image of the kids that look like us. Do I agree with everything that AI did? Absolutely not. You can't agree with everything any man does. 
or any human does. But at the end of the day, he represented and he looked like a real normal black male. And it's hard to find that uh, in the media. It's hard to find that on TV, period. Now, just a regular black man that you would go have a beer with. I, I, I th- my take on that, Kwame, is one of the dangerous messages we've gotten into, in my view, is there's so much focus on allegedly what we can't do mm-hmm. because of racism, and there's virtually no focus on what we can do if we put our mind to it. Mm-hmm. That's where, when I listen to your channel, that's what I hear underneath your message is like, hey, let's tell people what they can do because if Kwame Brown can come out of his situation, how, how, and again, you were blessed to to be six foot 11 and and I get it, but there's still a lot of obstacles you had to overcome. And so there should just be more of a focus on. See, that's the thing. People think it's just about height. I, I have cousins that's seven foot. I have brothers that's 6'10", 6'11". It, like you said, it's about decision making. Uh, it's about mindset and decision making. They made mistakes that allowed me to look at their situation and say, you know what? There's no there's no rose petals at the end of that tunnel. I see where that's going to take me. So let me try something different. So you're absolutely right. People talk about where I'm from, my level of education. They talk about my father, but they won't talk about the perseverance and how I made it despite of all those negative things. Um, Same way when they talk about Lamar Jackson, when we talk about black folks in general, we always seem to highlight what we think they can't do. This guy is like one of the number one quarterbacks who made history, who've done things that other quarterbacks have have not done. These so-called great quarterbacks but we always talk about his in the pocket passing. It's always like we're never good enough. And, and I'm tired of black people accepting people telling them that they're not good enough when we do so many great things. Kwame, what's your take? I see you a lot of times with an American flag on your hat. And, and that's another part of the messaging that I think uh, has gotten out of hand from athletes is like, we're dumping on the country that, you know, when you go look around the rest of the world, there's more opportunity for us here than any place else. Right. I mean, I, I ask some of these athletes that you get them into a quiet space without the TV on and be like, OK, well, you got mad at me for having a flag on my YouTube. But why do you think so many people are coming here? And when you try to get them to explain that, it's the craziest answers you're ever going to hear. And it's like this country has problems. Every country has problems. But for you to be a black man in America and with a high school diploma, I think LeBron just has a high school diploma as well. And you can accumulate millions of dollars and you can get you some property. And those same rights that are afforded to white men are now afforded to you as long as you're a law abiding citizen. I don't understand what the issue is. I mean, we had people, we had forefathers that died and fought for our rights. So we didn't have to fight so hard. So I'm not going to sit here and cry about and worry about things that I can't change. My mom used to always tell me it don't matter. Just focus on what you can do in every situation. I used to come back crying. Mama, they did do it. Mama, he said that it don't matter. Focus on what you can do. What can you do to change the situation? What can you do to better your situation? And every time I analyze and I look at it like that, I usually find the answer despite, you know, the frustration. You know, one of the things that I think uh, inspires your point of view that's different from mine. I I grew up in Indianapolis. Uh, My father uh, owned a bar in the inner city. And so my kind of uh, mentality of, of like, I'm gonna provide for myself, I'm gonna take care of myself comes from you know, my father and what he accomplished. But I think part of where your mentality comes from is like, hey man, I got some property, I know how to farm, I can produce my own food, that I can survive regardless of what happens. Some of you Negroes can't even, wouldn't know how to plant a seed and produce your own food, it, that the, the good old boy and the 
farmer or whatever, just the, I can take care of myself because I'm from the South, I was taught how to hunt and fish. All of that kind of contributes to your point of view and the masculinity that, that you show. Am I, am I accurate about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just raised by older men. Like, I'm not a renaissance man. I don't know how to do everything, but I just I just know how to take care of myself. I mean, it's just, I was raised up with a loving mother, but I, she understood that uh, with my father going to prison that I also needed a man around. So um, I was raised with my uncles and, and the, the older gentleman that took me to work. Uh, he didn't allow me to make excuses. He didn't, he didn't look at, I think a lot of times as adults, we look at kids' situations and we pacify them. And I don't think I'd be the man who I am today if he pacified and let my situation be a crutch or an excuse. Uh, when my brothers went to prison and it was just my mom and we were on welfare and I wanted to go out and get a job, he looked at me and he told me the honest truth. No one cares that your brothers are in jail. No one cares that your mother is by herself with all you, the rest of you children. What are you going to do about it? You could be stupid and follow your brothers or you can get up and go to work, which, you know, it won't be the, the most money in the world. But at least, you know, the things that come with a woman being by themselves, you won't you would help her not have to deal with that. He told me and warned me about men coming around. He told me everything. And he was just honest with a 14 year old. And right then and there, I made a decision. And I've been working since I was 14 years old. And just now that I'm 39, I learned how to work smarter and not harder and just know what I need from life. And it's like if if you learn how to live with less, if you learn how to feed yourself, if you learn how to be more self-sufficient, then you don't need as much money. So some people are critical of, you know, your the tenor of your show. It's a bit more raw than what we're seeing from Kwame now. The, 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 I watch your show and see the rawness, but I, I go, there's no way this dude isn't really smart because uh, that rawness is laced with an intellect and a common sense that could only come from a really intelligent person who if he can go down to the street corner and talk to the boys in the hood. And if he went and had to go talk to Barack Obama or Donald Trump, he'd know how to handle that conversation as well. What, what do you say to the people that like, your show is too raw, it's too profane, and there's too much beef uh, with your show? I would ask them, where have they been under a rock for the last 40 years? Because my show represents reality and what you see outside. Most of the things I say uh, is things that I either live through or experience or, or I actually see. Um, when I quote a rap song, they don't like me using the word, the N word, but then when I quote the lyrics of this rap song, it says, sexy little B, sexy little H, let an N word play in your throat, throat babies, I'm trying to bust all on you. Now, here I am, a man with four daughters, so it's like you're talking about the way that I speak, but listen to our music. Listen to what, who gets paid for what they're saying. I kill an N-word here, I kill an N-word there. They get the most money. So, you know, don't try to censor certain people, but if you give them the label of a rapper and you get, you get money off of them, then it's free game for them to say whatever. So I just don't get it. Well, we, we, got, we got little Nas X. They'll send him to schools to make our kids like him. But then next day, you know, he's naked in a, in, a, in a rap video sliding down to the devils. You know what? And he'll be the third video up under baby videos. And so but I'm the bad guy for pointing it out or because I use profanity. Well, what I think you have tapped into and it's why I'm such a big supporter is like if we're going to reach certain audiences and certain people, we have to engage them on a level that they understand and are attracted to. And then mm -hmm. once we engage them, then we can expose them to a higher level of thinking, logic, a, a more strategic way of going about life. I think mm -hmm. you're actually being very strategic. It's not something I can pull off. I can occasionally do it, 
but it's not something I can pull off. It's not the lane for me, but I see you creating an audience that eventually is like, okay, like Kwame, love what he's doing, but let me sample what Jason Whitlock does or what mm -hmm. Boyce Watkins does. I see you opening doors for other people by getting down, getting your hands dirty and talking mm -hmm. to people on the level that they understand. Right. And then that's the thing they don't get. Even I, I have a, um, I have a white gentleman, uh, blessed beyond belief on YouTube. Uh, he follows my channel and he's a Christian. He don't like the cursing at all, but he understands the bigger message. So what he does is he take back, he dissect what I'm saying and he'll explain it to his audience in the way that they can receive it. And so that's what we all should do when on YouTube, a lot of these guys, they want to be known as the best thinker and the best everything. I realize I have a ceiling in what, uh, how far I can go and how far I can communicate with people. So if you like Jason Whitlock and how witty he is and the way he break it down, let me come over to Jason Whitlock's page, have a conversation with him. Don't bring all the cursing and let's have a conversation. And then now you can go take it to your audience and break it down the way that they understand it. And a lot of people don't do that, which it, it, it limits us all because nowadays we all try to find a reason not to like someone. As soon as I said I'm going on Jason Whitlock's show, first thing they said was, oh, man, he talked bad about LeVar Ball. What do you think about that? I'm like, um, he's a man. He has an opinion. Of course, I have a different reason for liking LeVar Ball because I wish I had a man present when I was going through certain situations and have a man come in and step in and, and, and say some of the stuff he was saying the way he was saying it, because I think that's a level of protection that a man brings. So I'm not the type of person that's gonna, we've all became too sensitive. They wanted me not to like you before I even came on your show because we have a difference of opinion. And to me, that makes us weak. Well, and I'll say this about, and I would love to hear your expound on your thoughts on LeVar Ball, but I would ask anybody to, what have I said about LeVar Ball in the last year, year and a half? He transitioned, he's playing a completely different role and I support it. And I tip my hat to him for what he's done for his three sons, but now that he's faded to the back and letting his grown kids uh, be in the spotlight in space. I haven't criticized LeVar Ball and really don't have a problem with him and have told people like, you got to give a man credit for strategy. And, and we don't, we, we just think, <laughs> my mother, I'm gonna I'm get down and, and talk how I occasionally talk. My mother always said, there's certain guys that are tender dicks and anything <laughs> they stick their dick in, they fall in love with, they tender. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. what I give LeVar Ball credit for, and this is black men, we need to tap into this. Like, uh, marry somebody who can help you produce the kids that you want. This man wanted some athletes. He wanted some tall athletes. So he went out and married a tall woman and had kids with her, found a woman that he knew was gonna be a hell of a mother for him. He was strategic. I'm not saying he doesn't love his wife, but I'm just saying you can apply some strategy to it because that love thing and lust is gonna come and go. Do mm -hmm. you have somebody that when your fruit is produced, are they going to tend to it, develop it the way you want it developed? And will, or, 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 do they have the genetics to help you? to help you get exactly what you want. So I tip my hat to LeVar. He's, the guy is very strategic and smart. I didn't like the way he handled Lonzo's first year in the league. He was too out front. But I got no complaints about LeVar Ball, and I could care less that the man has been critical of me. But anyway, your thoughts on LeVar and why you like him. But you have the right to think whatever you want to think. And that's what I'm saying. Like, people got to understand that two people can be friends with different thoughts, different beliefs, different everything. That's that's not the reason. Are you saying that people should be friends with people that say everything the same and think everything the same? Like, I just think that's the flaw in our society now. Like, it, 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 I, I respect your thoughts on LeVar because that's your right to have them. Um, I'm just saying from a young male perspective, a young black male perspective, not having that strong representation, I didn't even have a problem with the way that he came in so aggressive, only because anytime a black athlete does or says anything now, 
is so heavily scrutinized. Um, the white players come in and they get to go and, and learn and, and enjoy the game. Brian Scalabrini is called the white mama. Brian Cardinal made a lot of money and no one talks about it. So it's like they get to come in, they get to, you know, better their families, have a good career, and then they're off. Uh, us black players, the moment we're drafted, the moment we start getting attention in high school, it's all this expectation, it's all this uh, hype, it's all this scrutinizing all the way to you're done and even after you're done, almost to the point where they want to mess your name up to yourself and your community. And I just think it's time out for that. It's too many players that have gone through the NBA that after they're done, they can't even get a job because of the way these commentators talk about it. So where does your, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this if you're not interested, I, but I, I got to ask, where does your conflict, beef, disagreement, tension stand with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson? Well, I mean, I never looked at it as a beef. I, I, I was the only one acting like a real common, decent person. I tried to reach out to Stephen Jack. I don't know Matt Barnes. I don't know Matt Barnes from a hill of beans. All I know is that I, I you know, he was on the court a couple of times. I played him, but I actually have hung out with Stephen Jackson. We have mutual friends. We played on the same team. Um, he's uh, hung out with myself and my my one of my baby mothers. Mothers. He's he's taken her to the club. So it's like I thought we had a different report. Um, I've come to his club, Cream Ultra Lounge. Um, so I thought it was different, but you know, with Jack today, with this newfound fame and this newfound activism, he wasn't talking like a man. He was talking like he was something different. And so I don't know where we stand. I mean, we don't have to stand nowhere. Um, I just don't agree with these guys in the way that they speak towards each other. Um, we don't attack white people or white uh, players the same way that they do for black players. And I think they get paid to do that. And I think they know they know they get paid to do that. So me and Matt, me and him can never be cool because he crossed the line from a from a manhood perspective that I would have never crossed with him. Um, so I don't think me and him could ever be cool, but it don't never have to be a situation where it's a problem because I've never ran into Matt Barnes anywhere else. So I don't anticipate running into him anywhere, you know, period. So, but with Steven, you know, I just hope he really matured and wake up that, dog, it ain't, it ain't about all this fame. It ain't about uh, having the number one show. Uh, it's about being a man. And I, I don't think he's focused on being a man. I think he's focused on being a celebrity. And I don't too much like celebrities. Well, that is where you and I agree in terms of I don't like elites and I don't like celebrities. L let me throw this by you as it relates to Steven Jackson, because I know Steven Jackson and and have spent some time with him and, and like Steven Jackson. Uh, I agree with you that I, I think he's been in error uh, in some ways and maybe a bit out over his skis as some kind of activist. I, I, I you know, I wish people were more comfortable following than leading a lot of times because great leaders a lot of times are, are the best followers. Uh, but, but what I think I see in Steven Jackson is a man on a journey, an intellectual journey uh, like all of us. And, and so I'm, I'm reluctant to be hypercritical if someone that close to me had been killed on video, uh, I'm not sure how I would react or what kind of damage that would do to me psychologically. I had a cousin who I helped raise killed by the police in Indianapolis. Thank God I didn't see it. I heard about it, talked to people face to face that were there. He was tasered and electrocuted in the rain. I look at his picture every day. It sits in my house, uh, but thank God it's not on tape. But, but I guess I, I'm just more patient because I, I think that, I do think that Stephen's trying to practice the Muslim Islam faith. And I, do, I think he's trying to be a better person. He's just having to figure it out on, on, along the way because uh, like yourself, I'm not sure if he had the strongest uh, father 
parental relationship growing up as a, as a young person. And so it's just a lo little bit of a longer process of him figuring things out. But see, like I said, I, I really didn't know him off the court like that. Like I said, I thought we were something different, but obviously I, we wasn't because, I mean, I just didn't take too kindly to the, the – he's two different people. You got to be careful with guys like that because in front of people, he's all teeth and smiles. And then when you try to talk to him from a man-to-man -man basis, it's all arrogance. And I didn't really respect that, that play in traffic line. Because once you start manifesting death and talking like that on a level, we all have people, you know, and that's what a lot of times these rappers and these young people do that make a lot of money. When you make a lot of money, you have to be very careful what you say and what you do because everybody around you is listening and watching. And you don't know what somebody around you uh, may think you want or may think you need. And they may go out and try to do that just so they can continue being around you. So when he said something about playing in traffic, I mean, I, I immediately told him, no, nah, I have my kids around me, man. I'm not on that type of time. But you introduced boxing and fighting. So that's one thing. And then you take it to talking about meeting in traffic. That's when I stay away from people like that. Because the moment you say stuff like that and someone kid get hurt or, or you hurt someone else and you don't know who they're connected to, you don't know what could happen. And it becomes a domino effect and you can destroy families like that. So men that can't be men and stand on what them, they say by themselves and they got a group with them, I too much really don't hang with men like that. Mm. Man, you got a wisdom beyond your years. Uh, you, you just, you preaching to a choir right now and, and it, it, it plays into the larger point I've been making pretty much all week is that there's so much feminine energy in the sports world and with mm -hmm. people in these media spaces that all they know to do is whine and complain and bitch and cry like a woman. Now, I'm sorry mm -hmm. if that offends somebody, but or they tap into the other emotion of, oh, I can get violent. And mm -hmm. that's all they know about masculinity. And that's, uh, I'm gonna go back to again why I think you're so important is you're actually, that masculinity actually manifests itself in a strategic, logical approach to life mm -hmm. and standing on some real principles. That, that's, that's again why I think you're so important. You're a representation of like, let's go ahead and play this chess game and get out of this game of checkers because life and white folks are playing chess and mm -hmm. many of you are playing checkers. Right. And that's the thing, like he, he said that to me and all this is supposed to be starting over something that's supposed to have been a joke. And then now it manifests into something bigger and then God forbid someone lose their life and then what? Like you, this is what you're supposed to be advocating against and preaching against. So masculinity is not who can beat someone in a fight is okay we can disagree but the real man walk away unscathed from it because what you saying is not going to affect my everyday life because i'm a man and i built things around me that makes my life protected and comfortable so that regardless of whether we disagree or not it's not going to matter to me so i don't have to have a bunch of friends with me to go protect me because i understand i'm a man so i'm not going to speak to you in a way because as a man, I got to put myself out there and I can win or I can lose. But that's what keeps me that level of respect for another man, that that fear of losing and that knowing that conscious fact that I can lose. So I'm not out here walking around like I'm some protected chick because I got five or six dudes that may or may not have guns. I'm by myself. All right, let's move on to uh, Stephen A. Smith. Where do things stand there between you and Stephen A. Smith? Oh, I got about another 20 years to deal with Stephen A. Smith. I, I mean, I think Stephen... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think he's a coward. I can't stand what he represents. Uh, he represents a male that's ignorant to the fact that, yes, you make money, but uh, you're making money off of the backs of your own people. Um, he, if he literally was not that animated, if he just talked analytics and he did not put players down the way that he does and say things like trade them for a box of cereal 
and and get all loud like that, uh, he wouldn't be as effective, and he would no longer be needed. Um, he's a guy who can say things that other people can't say, and they pay him to do that. Um, in my opinion, is he says things that white people wish they could say to black people, and he says it in a way that he gets a pass because. I'm going to say this, what, what my issue uh, with, with Steven isn't, isn't that. I, I don't, look, his job is to analyze and criticize. He's a critic, and so uh, he's going to criticize the sports world. What, so what did, I don't like, I'm sorry, go why, ahead. Why was he at colleges and high schools talking about a player 10 years after he was done playing? I think you're talking about, he's talking about you? Yes, I've, I've yet to hear about him talking about any other player, white, black, or whomever else. It's just ironic to me that the first player drafted out of high school, number one, was a black man, and they sent a black man all the way down to high schools to tell them how bad of a guy, and you don't want to be like that guy, while he's making $4 million a year. I, I don't understand that. So let me explain it to you. And, and again, it, was, it's, it coincides with my point in terms of where my criticism of Stephen A. would come in. Look, you, you can't make the money that Stephen A. is making without climbing into bed with the NBA and Disney and the establishment. And so my problem with Stephen A. would be twofold is he's playing a character that's, I'm this outspoken, I'll say anything. You know, I, I got no puppet strings attached to me. You're just getting what I think. And no, you're not. You're getting what David Stern thinks and or thought because in order to uh, be that involved with the NBA, get the access, have a chance to be on the NBA Countdown Show, which I think they're giving him now, you have to be, you have to play, you have to be a voice for the establishment and the power. Mm -hmm. And so he's not speaking any truth to power. He's punching down is what you're basically saying. And, and mm -hmm. again, it's like, oh, you want to punch Kwame Brown? I never see you punch David Stern. And, mm -hmm. and so if I saw you punching David Stern, if I saw you punching Michael Jordan, then I would perhaps be like, okay, you want to throw a punch at me? I get it. You're an equal opportunity punch thrower. But what mm -hmm. you're saying is he's not. He punches down at the targets that he's directed to punch at by the NBA, by the people at Disney and ESPN. And so therefore, you have a justifiable problem with him. I get it. The other part of my problem with him, and then I'd like for you to follow in and expound, is the self-importance and the unwillingness to admit when you're wrong. And again, we've had a conversation here today that I'm about to admit and say something that I did not intend to say, but you've brought me to a point of enlightenment in this conversation where I'm gonna say, you know what? I shouldn't have called Randy Moss, Randy with an I in my collar. I took a shot there was probably a, 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 everything else I've said about Randy Moss this week, I'm a thousand percent on board with. Shouldn't have done that to the dude's name. I was wrong for that. Randy, I apologize. I may issue, away from this show, I may issue another apology over social media or whatever and say, you know, that's probably too far. That was too personal. Shouldn't have done it. But what I never see from Stephen A. Smith and a lot of these self-important people in the media because they're so deluded by the amount of money they make and how could mm -hmm. they be wrong? I make $12 million a year and everybody <laughs> loves me and blah, 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 blah. How could I be? You pointed out some things about what went on with you and the Washington Wizards and Stephen A. Smith, instead of acknowledging like, man, Jordan is the power and he created a narrative about Kwame Brown that was a, perhaps a bit unfair. You know what? Let me back off my criticism of Kwame and, and say, you know what, I was wrong. Let me admit 
in this instance, I was perhaps wrong, and there's some justification of what Kwame's doing. And that's why when the man went back at you and put together that six, seven minute tape, whatever, on ESPN, again, punching down. I never seen punch at Adam Silver. I never seen punch at the power structure. He done put together a six, seven minute tape on a man that, that, that you know, like, my God. You've been proven wrong, just admit it, then I would have some respect for you. That, th there's no accountability for himself, and then he's actually, he's pretending to be strong when really his criticism is weak. That's my issue with Stephen A. Smith. I mean, Stephen A., I mean, like you said, he's just a character, and uh, he can't get off that character because the only reason why people listen to him is because he, he seems so strong. And plus, um, they have advertising dollars behind him. Even now, you know, every time I get off of YouTube, when I go to scroll through a video, if I miss and touch my phone any kind of way, it will either go to First Take or The Breakfast Club. So they're doctoring up these little algorithms to make these guys seem more important to give the illusion uh, that they actually better than they are. Stephen A makes no sense on the way that he talks. Um, can you imagine respecting me as a man if I was to go and start talking about boxing because I watched boxing for 10, 15, 20 years, and now I start speaking about fighters in a manner that's disrespectful to them and their family? And the only reason why I can do that is because I said I watched it, but you've never seen me in a fight. Would you respect <laughs> me? So, uh, so as a not man... As yeah, go ahead. No, I wouldn't respect you as much as I would the opinions of the fighters that have actually been in the arena. Yeah, somehow Stephen A has found a way to get more respect than uh, most of our athletes, most of our current and former athletes. Uh, it was disgusting to watch him disrespect Jalen Rose, a uh, guy who was on the Fab Five, a guy who's an all-star, who was trying to tell him, hey, look, if he would have actually took the time to have a conversation and not that one-sided, aggressive, feminine uh, tone that he used to where he over-talks a man, uh, Jalen Rose, Rose was trying to tell him, hey, look, that's disrespectful. You're calling the man out of his name. You're not even calling him what his mama called him. Uh, you're calling Chris Bosch, uh, Bosch Spice. Uh, this is disrespectful. As a man, the... If we, if we were in different times, these men, big, strong men that you're trying to emasculate to pretend like you're tough, uh, Skip Bayless is, what, 5'5"? Five, five? If this was a time that we could, you know, deal with people on a real man-to-man -man level, you wouldn't be able to talk to a man like that. And so we've, we are so far removed from that that we have men talking to men with a feminine tongue, which there's no consequence for it because you can sue that man. Uh, let me transition you to this. What would you do if you were still in the NBA and you played in New York and they're forcing this vaccine on you? What would you do? I would be doing I would do the same thing Kyrie is doing. I would have said no. Why? Because I would be skeptical of you trying to force me first of all, to do something with my body. Uh, secondly, I don't see the push uh, for white athletes to come out and advocate uh, for this donut shop. I like to call it donut shop because they get upset anytime you say the V word. But um, I don't see the white counterparts coming out to speak about it. And it hasn't proven. I have a, I have a friend. I used to be a barber. He used to cut my hair. He died and he was vaxxed. And, uh, he was juggernauted and everything else. And he passed away from it. So it's not like this thing is proven to do what they say it's going to do. It's still in a trial phase. So um, with those three things, I just wouldn't be able to trust it, especially just listening to Stephen A. this morning. He'd make you think that only black people is affected by it. He said when he walked into the nursing home, you see blacks dying, blacks this, black that. He didn't say this is affecting everybody. He just made it seem like it's a black thing. Well, they try to control people through fear, and that's mm -hmm. where my issue with the pandemic is, 
is like, hey man, if you have any understanding of history, we've gone through plagues worse than this. And I know mm -hmm. that oh, 700,000 people died. And, and, and I'm like, well, you do know like during the Spanish flu, or what, there was probably 150 million less Americans than there are today. And so you can throw out this, oh my God, uh, 700,000 people died. And, and not have the perspective like, yeah, there's a bunch more people here and the accounting on who's dying from COVID is a bit different, I believe. And so mm -hmm. I, I just think they're trying to scare all of us into staying in our homes and doing whatever the government tells us to do. Mm -hmm. And that's un-American to me. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's about that, that. And that's why I don't like this whole company policy thing. Like they're going to use every business to to help control. They would rather put Americans out of work over a vaccination or over a donut shop that, like I said, hadn't proven to do anything. Why won't they do that with some of these other diseases that's out here that, you know, this is there's no focus on anything else but this. And I think it's a part of a bigger picture and a bigger plan like you said, to control everybody. Because if that's the case, if they're going to be able to just, you know, anytime we have fear or anytime uh, there's something to be fearful about, they can just start taking our, our rights away. What's to stop them to, from doing it every time? Kwame, I've argued that Tom Brady should be the person that, Kwam, that uh, Kyrie is actually being that if Tom Brady stood up to the NFL, cause, cause it would be hard to convince me that Tom Brady actually took this vaccine. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just can't believe the way this guy has controlled everything that goes into his body, that he actually took this vaccine, but they say he took it, whatever. I, it's hard for me to believe. But I wish mm -hmm. that someone with his level of accomplishment, there's nothing left for him to prove as an athlete. I wish that he would step out here. And again, there, one of the things you're talking about, the difference between black and white athletes is that black athletes are demanded. You've got to be more than an athlete. You have to stand for all these societal issues and there's no pressure on white athletes. Mm -hmm. And damn it, Tom Brady should be under some pressure to stand up for these people, black and white who have mm -hmm. nobody speaking out for them other than Kyrie that, that don't want to take this vaccine. I think if Brady went out, he would become as important as Muhammad Ali was. And, and, and I think what Kyrie's done, and, and I know that I pr anticipate at some point Kyrie's going to fold or whatever and go play in the NBA and get that money. And I, I'm still, I still think what Kyrie's doing is nearly as courageous as what Muhammad Ali did, and I wish that Tom Brady had those kind of testicles. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's not even a push for it. I asked in New York, you know, where's Tom Brady? Where's Aaron Rodgers? You mean to tell me all these guys just said, okay, I'll get it. Like, no, they expect white men to make their own decision. They, they think that white people are smarter and they can make their own decision as a whole. With black folks, we still need that leader. We still need that leader that they give us. And they gave us LeBron. They gave us Kyrie. Uh, anybody with a big, large platform uh, like Nicki Minaj, if you speak out against something that they say, somehow you're crazy or you're misinformed. You're giving out misinformation. So I just don't understand why people can't see it. Um, there's no protections for people who do speak out. So that's why so many people either stay quiet or they just go along to get along. I want to, I got two more questions. And I'm going to let you go, let you get on with your day. Uh, Dave Chappelle, I loved what he did uh, in his stand-up comedy routine for Netflix. And, and again, I wrote about you, Dave Chappelle, and Kyrie Irving, like mm -hmm. taking these bold stances and being inspiring. Did you watch Chappelle's comedy routine, and what were your thoughts? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I thought he, it was classic Dave Chappelle. I mean, 
Um, they liked it when he was talking about people that they didn't like. <laughs> they was agreeing with him then. They say he was brilliant then. Um, Dave has always been able to push the line and uh, do. He does it better than anybody. He's the guy who can put truth in a joke in a way where it's like, wow, it's shocking and it's funny, and then it'll make some people like, whoa, I don't, I don't know whether to laugh. Let me look around first. So he, he's the greatest at doing that. And so I think the way he put it, that I'm not going to make any more jokes about you guys until I'm sure we're laughing together because that's supposed to be the ultimate goal. It's supposed to be all-inclusive. Uh, but it seems like uh, the way that we're going – it's not all inclusive. It's, it's, it's only going to be certain things you can say and certain people you can talk about. So hopefully what Dave Chappelle did was was show that co comedians still have that right to put truth in a joke because that's the only place that's was still safe to bring us all together, like I said. But if they take that away, I don't know what type of society is going to be. I guess everybody's going to be at the uh, psychiatrist ordering pills for their depression because you can't laugh can't go outside you got to wear a mask you can't gather it's like man what are we what are we turning into we'll end on this note uh kwame i, I want to ask you about just beef in general and mm -hmm. I, I i want your philosophy you you people say oh his channel is built around him beefing with other black personalities or or celebrities what is your philosophy as it relates? You and I have talked, you know, privately about, uh, you know, Dr. Boyce Watkins. I, I think he actually likes and supports what you're doing. Uh, I, I hope that somehow you guys could have some sort of, of peace because I actually think you're on the same team. Uh, but and 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 uh, I've seen. I, I got mixed thoughts on Tommy Sotomayor. Uh, just, <laughs> I, I get why you and him have a problem and I understand it. But anyway, your thoughts on just beef and how it plays into your channel and just your personality as it relates to people that you feel have said anything that uh, disrespects you. These guys don't really have beef. I think we use that terminology too loosely. Um, I come from a neighborhood in an area that if you had beef with somebody, you would know it because they would make their business to find you and see you. Um, what they're doing is they're riding a, a wave of algorithms. If you talk about Kwame Brown right now, especially a few months back, you're going to get hundreds of thousands of views. Um, so that's all what these guys are doing. They don't care what they got to say. They don't care what they have to do. Uh, and most people, they don't even try to find out what actually started the problem is just whoever likes Dr. Boyce Watkins and because who he's connected to, it doesn't matter what I say. And, and Dr. Boyce Watkins understood that. And that's why when I first came into YouTube, I said, we have a sector of men to like to stand on other men's shoulders because Dr. Boyce would have been okay with me if I embraced him with open arms when he was trying to email and text me. He would have been my buddy. Yeah, you know, he can come up under me and I would have been doing interviews with that sector and then I wouldn't be able to have the voice that I have now and say the things in the way that I want to say it. Uh, I didn't come to YouTube trying to be friendly with everybody because I recognize that there's a problem. The people that everyone's saying is good, I just see them that they're not. Um, I didn't begin talking about Boyce Watkins. Boyce Watkins began talking about me. Boyce Watkins compared me to Jim Jones, who is a psychopathic terrorist, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know how you draw those conclusions of a man you never met. So I just fired back and I met I met his fire with fire. Um, and in our society, we're so used to somebody saying, oh, well, he talked about you take the high road. That's not what men do that I've been around. You know, you, you talk about me, I talk about you. And another thing they say is, oh, he'd been quiet for 20 years. I wasn't necessarily quiet. I took my lumps and got in trouble for the things that I said to the people who I said it to. It's just that we didn't have media uh, platforms that we have now when I was playing. They wasn't as big. Uh, and so I don't understand how you can say that my channel is a beef channel when I even said this is quicksand and that people were going to come to me and one by one 
Charlemagne the God talked about me. This is after two people started talking about me, which is Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes. Somehow the number one draft pick finally made it to the Breakfast Club. My whole and two or three of my family members. I was so unimportant in the league to make the Breakfast Club for making history, but I made it because my father killed a woman. And I made it because my brother killed a woman. And I argued with two people on a podcast that a guy on their show uh, owns a part of. So it's all a game. And Dr. Boyce, he, uh, he's intertwined with that umbe- umbrella with Charlemagne the God as well. And, uh, you know, so it's all a game. Everybody who's connected to Charlemagne the God, these guys went on different podcasts that Charlemagne was connected to, Big Facts podcast and all these different podcasts. And they tried to verbally attack me. And when that didn't work, they they sick the YouTube hounds on me. So they don't want truth in our society no more. They don't want men that's going to stand up and fight back and say, no, you're wrong. And you guys are a bunch of clowns. And here's why. And it's easily to prove that they're clowns. Just listen to them talk. You know, and it, it wasn't me. My channel is not a beef channel. My channel is for these kids to show that if you want to be an individual, you have to stay away from people like that. There's a lot of kids that they want to be individuals. When I got drafted, and you might know this guy, I'll say his initials, uh, WS, WWS. Do you know what oh, I'm talking yeah, about? Oh, yeah, of course. Worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so the first, as soon as I got drafted, he come up to me. You're going to need me. I'm like, who are you? Don't worry about all that. You're going to need me. I'm going to need you for what? And then I, well, once I start doing my investigation on who he is, can't really find anything. But he's connected to every player. And I just thought that's weird. And, and it's a couple guys like that, and it's a couple women like that that I've met that I just simply said no to, that somehow I became public enemy number one. And there's a lot of children that have to go through that. And people don't understand what I'm actually saying. This is bigger than that. And if they take a deeper dive and look at Look at these black athletes when they're done playing uh, from a financial side. Um, The first thing Billy Hunter's son used to ask us is who's watching your money? Uh, These players are talking about being black and having a black power and black pride. They don't know where their money is. My number one thing to tell these guys is they better get their money. I don't care who your financial advisor is. Go get your money. You better start investing it into your community and don't give your money to anybody else ever again. And then you need to you got to start thinking black. You got to get a conscious mind not to say white people are less than. But white people, big, they, they lift their own people up first. And I don't think we do that. We always go take our money and give it to somebody else. And then at the end of the day, we turn back around and say, oh, what happened? And so it's, it's a lot. It's a system that's running. And they and the people that that want to say all these things about me, they know I'm right. And they just don't want to deal with the ugly truth of the matter. Kwame, uh, you're 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 just as smart as I thought, and maybe a tad smarter. And I had really high expectations, uh, but I'm. <laughs> I'm tell- I grew up at my father's bar, the Masterpiece Lounge, Indianapolis, Indiana. Bunch of guys, high school educated. These guys were brilliant. Mm-hmm. And it, it, common sense is so valuable and it's in sh- such short supply. And man, you would just emote common sense and instincts and a, I don't even want to call it a street knowledge, but just just common sense and man, I appreciate it. I, I'm going to tell you flat out, bro. I am going to stand on your shoulders because you're <laughs> lifting up uh, some masculine energy that that I just want to amplify. And and sometimes, you know, people, you know, I'm an old dude. I'm 54, uh, but I don't mind following in behind young people. And 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 you, you know, you got to get in. But listen, though, as an elder, you're going to be able to articulate things in a way that I'm not going to be able to do. It. You're going to be able to to reach a broader audience that may not listen to me. Uh, and so that's what it's about. My message is not about me getting all the accolades and all the credit. I think everybody should share in the conversation 
and take out what what you think are key points that you can expound on. And then now we're having a bigger, louder, broader conversation. And then now we can affect and help real change. And, and these kids need to have an opportunity. There's no reason we're teaching criminal, uh, critical race theory in school. That's a theory. We need to be teaching STEM. We need to be teaching coding and trade, something that we can do to research the show. This is what will help these children. Uh, and, and I just don't get why we won't do that. The next election, I don't want to hear nothing about race. I want to hear something about STEM going into these schools, coding and trades going into these schools. Otherwise, stop telling me kids are the future. Just tell me, tell me that you're using these kids uh, for a prison to pipeline and juvenile detention centers and things like that, because that's the only thing that's happening. Uh, hey, man, anytime you want to come on the show, please let me know uh, anything I can do to support you. Uh, I've, I've said it over social media uh, and I say it again. We must protect Kwame at all costs. And uh, I'm going to be part of that fruit of Islam for Kwame standing around in a bow tie <laughs> willing to take people <laughs> out if they come for you. So uh, thank you, brother. I appreciate you, man. All right, that's uh, Kwame Brown. That was everything that I expected to get uh, from Kwame Brown. I'm going to put a bow tie on, or a bow, not a bow tie, on this conversation. But first, I want to tell you about ExpressVPN. If you haven't been paying attention to what's going on lately on the internet, then you should. Major security breaches have been serious issues this year. Companies like Facebook and LinkedIn have had to deal with hundreds of millions of their customers' data being stolen and used online. You don't want that to happen to you. That's why you need to use ExpressVPN to keep your data private while online. With ExpressVPN, they'll provide the strong security that you need while you're online. They can protect you from phishing attacks and scams that can randomly infect your email, as well as give you the safe space needed to shop online. That will be crucial during the upcoming holiday season. So if you, like me, believe that your data is your business, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN on the market, expressvpn.com slash fearless, and get three extra months for free that's expressvpn.com slash fearless. Go to expressvpn.com slash fearless to learn more. All right, let's, let's wrap up this show. Uh, I want to put a bow on it. I, I'm really pleased with what we did here today. Uh, I started by talking about the Emasculated Sports Personality Network, ESPN, and their launch of their movie, The Crying Game. It's been going on uh, for a year. And then we had a very important conversation with Kwame Brown. And Kwame Brown, to me in this past hour, just showed everybody exactly who he is. Grown ass man with mature thoughts, uh, very intelligent, sophisticated, has a purpose, has a goal, has a strategy about how he wants to execute uh, his plan. And, and the reason why I wanted to have Kwame on, particularly at this time and, and in this conversation, is because what you just watched for the last hour, that's masculinity. The stuff that's passing for masculinity violence, threats of violence. Uh, you know, I want to beat someone up if I disagree with them. Uh, that's not masculinity. That's, or it's toxic masculinity that should be eliminated. ESPN should be trying to fight that. But instead, what they're doing is they're emasculating their personalities. And so I want to replay our ESPN crying game clip, and then we'll, we'll get out of here. I'll have a final comment and we'll get out of here. Replay the clip. And so you can't relate to that if you're white, but you can listen and you can uh, try to help because this is not okay. It's just not. Thank you for everybody that reached out to me 
And um, like, I know it's getting better, but it's not better, better yet and better for everybody. And, um, you know, like, we just got to keep, you know, staying together, man, and just doing what we can. Yeah. And for us to be moving back and not forward in 21st century, like I said, man, National Football League, this hurts me. The clock is ticking, man. I'm okay. sorry. Gents, and I say this respectfully, we got to do better. Don't let them emasculate you. Don't be overcome by all the feminine energy that surrounds you and sits on set. Don't let them check your balls in before the cameras come on. Keep your balls. I don't dislike any of you. Uh, actually like most of you, but, but let's cut it out. The crying game, it's a gimmick. The Emasculated Sports Personalities Network, it's a gimmick. It's not healthy. It's not what this country needs. We need strong men. We don't need to run around and apologizing for being strong men. Real men need to come out of the closet and stand on their own two feet and let them hang. You, all of you, join the fearless army. Hit the subscribe, the like button, sign up for induction to join. The, we're gonna take this country back if we can get men to stand up and be men. And it's not about being stupid, it's about being what Kwame and I just were for the past hour. This crying game BS, cut it out. Randy Moss, I'm sorry that I, I hurt your feelings and, and got you so emotional you done tapped in, oh, I wanna beat up this 54-year-old fat man. I apologize for calling you Randy with an I. I really, sincerely, I just want you to do better. Cut this crying BS out. Somebody dies, go ahead and cry. Your dog dies, go ahead and cry. But somebody sends an email, somebody calls your son a bad word going through the drive-thru, George Floyd lets Derek Chauvin assist him in a lifelong suicide, dry them tears. Let's be men. All right, let's play tomorrow, get out of here, and we'll see you on Monday. Freedom.